Yeah, thank you. Uh, so first of all, thanks to Ravi and Rajmohan for inviting me here and to the great trip. And so far, it's been very enjoyable. So uh, I will be uh, talking about some collaborative work that's been going on in this uh, big uh, consortium project called Network Science CTA. CTA stands for Collaborative Technology Alliance. It's funded by the uh, US Army. Uh, so there are some Army applications to this, but uh, uh, I mean, I'll be very general in this particular talk. Uh, and, and this is very uh, still in the fundamental research stage. It's not uh, that, all that close to the application stage yet. So uh, the focus of my talk would be on um, a sp particular type of a network design game. Uh, which is uh, not quite uh, the same as what we heard in the morning, where you have multiple agents and uh, there's a lot of uh, 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 sort of uh, network formation going on. But in this particular case, I'll be looking at two agents and uh, essentially uh, trying to play a game on a particular network topology. So uh, uh, this is how I've organized my talk. So I'll sort of start with a brief description of certain network design problems, like why are these games being played, and uh, the, uh, sort of what are, what's being optimized, and so on and so forth. And I'll describe a couple of uh, models for uh, an adversary, uh, uh, both benign and strategic. And uh, then I'll uh, go on to give some uh, simple non-cooperative game form formulations and kind of uh, go, be more, more and more general as, we, uh, as the talk progresses. And at some point, if I run out of time, I'll just talk. Uh, so in particular, I'll be talking about both one-shot games and Markovian variants, multi-stage variants of those Markovian variants, et cetera. And uh, I think the, uh, as, we, as we progress, the analyzability or analytical tractability also diminishes in some sense. But there'll be still some, um, but the, on the application spectrum, it kind of uh, becomes uh, more and more uh, applicable as we go from one shot to multi-stage. So the relevance to this workshop, I mean, this is clearly if it's the games uh, part of the workshop, but there may be some other, uh, uh, like it may also fit the epidemic part of the workshop because you may imagine this type of a scenario where uh, uh, like an adversary wants to prevent you from spreading information uh, and you want to spread information as far as you want to. And uh, so, so those types of, of scenarios can be potentially modeled in uh, this, uh, this type of a topology control framework. So, um, so this is a, like a one slide description of what the basic uh, goal uh, of, the, of the network designer is. He basically wants to design a network for a purpose. So he has a graph G, uh, vertex at V, H set E, and there could be weights on the nodes or edges. Um, uh, and then there's a property which, is, which the designer has, network property P. I'm being very abstract here. And I'll give some examples of these properties as we go along. And, and then there are like two types of problems of design, edge, edge problems, and node problems. And, and there's also a cost budget B, which is given to the uh, designer. So the designer is told you can add capital B edges from the complement graph to G such that P is maximized or minimized, uh, like depending on what it is. So some examples of P are that uh, it could be a global property like diameter, average shortest path length, connectivity, et cetera, or it could be some, something somewhat more local like eccentricity, which is more node focused. It's still a global property. You need the entire graph to compute it, but it's uh, focused on a node or between a centrality of a node, which is sort of node properties. And uh, people have shown, like, uh, I think it started with work by Adam Mearson from, uh, he was at UCLA back then, and then uh, um, uh, Eric Domain, who sort of showed that the basic problem of adding these B edges to a graph such that it has the uh, minimum diameter or minimum average short path length, those are NP hard, and, but they are, uh, he related them to the, they related them to the approximability, approximability of K median or K center or those types of problems. So it's a factor of uh, the best algorithm known uh, for those problems. Uh, he, they expressed the complexity in, in those terms. Now similarly, there, there are some, some folks in our consortium who have looked at node problems 
uh, which are like, uh, uh, suppose you're Wall Street, you want to upgrade your routers, and you want to uh, replace some subset of your routers with ultra low latency routers. So essentially you're taking, so here these are node problems, so if a, a flow passes through a node, it accumulates delay as it passes through the node. So if you want to do an upgrade, you don't want to upgrade the entire network, you want to just replace some nodes, and their delay sort of goes to almost to zero or to a smaller value than before. And so then, again, it's NP hard, like what's the average latency, where, which node should I replace, and so on. But, but this is just a general setup of what kind of design uh, problems a network designer could be interested in. So uh, in this particular case is an example where there's a graph. This is the current graph with the it's a node focus problem where the red node uh, is kind of trying to, uh, so the network designer is trying to optimize some property for the red node. And the particular property is eccentricity, uh, which is, uh, at, at this point, it's uh, one. It's actually two, because there exists a two-hop path from red to this, uh, this node here. But, but if I add this edge, the eccentricity sort of drops to one. So, so then, but, but any other place, if you add an edge, it would not drop to one. So, so therefore, the optimization guy would want to add this edge and only this edge, sort of. So uh, this is one, uh, an example. So, yeah. Eccentricity is the, sorry. Uh, eccentricity of a node is the maximum uh, shortest, a uh, maximum of all the shortest path emanating from that edge. For this node. Yeah, for this node. Or in, uh, I think in network science, some people call it a very similar version. They call it closeness centrality. So, it's, so uh, adversarial action over time. So, so now consider that there's an adversary, and I'll be using capital letter A, boldface A for an adversary and D for a designer. So it could be that I, I, I'm seeing a graph, and I want to remove some edges uh, from that graph. So essentially, I want to. I've present. I've been presented with this, and I take this action, some action, and I go to uh, next graph, G sub t plus uh, sub t plus one, which is a subset of uh, G sub t, and this uh, typically results in uh, uh, loss of the value of p. Now, loss meaning if you want to maximize the problem, it would uh, uh, it would kind of go down, and vice versa if it's a minimization problem. So network designer now has to take action. So uh, now, we, one, uh, to just to keep things simple, you could imagine that uh, the network designer observes the uh, deletion process, and then he wants to fix the problem. So he can just restore the topology by just going back to GT, or he could add, end up adding some different edges, like some GT, and, and those different edges, and this uh, arrow sub D means uh, a designer uh, action. Uh, and this results in a different graph, G prime T, which is not necessarily the same as GT. So this could be the uh, two families of actions that a network designer could take. Now this, this uh, one could imagine from any given uh, graph, a starting point, you could have a partial order of various topologies of graphs that you could generate. And that is kind of, uh, uh, I just uh, put a one-line code into Mathematica. It generated me all possible graphs, or labeled graphs on four nodes, six, 64 of them. So it's two to the n choose two possible graphs. Uh, now, it's a partial order because uh, each of these is a, uh, are all graphs with two edges, all graphs with three edges, all graphs with four edges, et cetera, et cetera. So at the lowest uh, point, it's uh, the complete graph on four nodes. And here is the empty graph at the top. So now here you could have a sequence of addition events. Uh, link addition events could uh, result in this path through, the topo uh, through this post set topology, uh, or this path, or this path, uh, depending on how the actions, addition actions happen. Now if the adversary uh, also takes actions, then it could result in a walk in this uh, particular post set. Uh, and uh, an example of a walk would be something like this. So maybe you started off at this graph, and the adversary ends up deleting, what, which one? One, four. The edge one, four, it goes to this graph. Then the designer adds uh, two, four, it goes to this graph. And then uh, adversary, uh, adversary deletes another edge and another edge. So, so you could imagine that this could kind of result, result in some sort of a walk in this graph. Now, what we really want um, at a high level in, in this uh, task 
is to kind of study interesting properties of some dynamical processes under such under different adversarial models on this type of a uh, poset structure. Now, having said that, uh, it's, uh, this is the poset structure is exponentially large in size, so uh, we had to uh, sort of pare down the problem to make it uh, more tractable to see what are the tractable, interesting use cases of the problem, which I'm going to go over next. And the tractable use case that we are interested in, which seems to have some uh, uh, applicability, is this notion of policy-compliant topologies. So policy compliant topology is essentially it's a densifying sequence of topologies. So you start with G0 and then G1 has is G0 union some set of edges on top of G0. And G2 is G1 union some new set of edges on top of G1, etc. So, so and why is it policy compliant? It's policy, imagine this scenario where, so this comes up in command and control type systems where you have like, uh, two companies who make an alliance, and the two managers make an, make an alliance with each other. And then, once the alliance happens, they ask their deputies to also make an alliance. Now imagine that the company sort of get uh, fall out, and the manager link is severed. It doesn't make sense to have the uh, link between the two deputies at that point of time. So their link, the existent, depends on this link. So if, if a link gets deleted, you may have to backtrack all the way to the most policy compliant configuration. So you're essentially, instead of walking in the post set arbitrarily, you'll walk along a particular line segment along in, the, in that post set. So that kind of, uh, this backtracking type of a system, and I'll go over an example exactly how we model this, uh, that uh, results in uh, it becoming a little more tractable uh, to analyze. So uh, now, f first, uh, I'll just uh, start with uh, a benign adversary. So imagine such a policy compliant sequence where the uh, adversaries like nature, wireless interference, thermal noise, etc. So uh, the attacks are going to happen randomly uh, on some link, uh, some uh, set of links. And uh, the actions essentially uh, are not in step, of, uh, in step with how the network designer is uh, augmenting the network. So the designer still wants to optimize the property like eccentricity or uh, shortest path length, et cetera, but he's incurring these costs, which are costs to add, delete, or maintain an edge. And sometimes he may, may want to delete an edge because that would result in lower maintenance cost in future. Because if I have more edges, then I have to, have to spend more time maintaining it. So, now it's a dynamical, uh, dynamical process. It's more uh, like a stochastic DP type setting where you have some arrival rate of uh, uh, attacks and the defender sort of knows the model of the attack because it's a thermal noise type of model. Uh, and then he has to figure out what's the optimal policy to where to uh, add the link uh, under a certain uh, given topology and so on and so forth. So, so that, that results in, uh, like, you can get some interesting policies which are, uh, 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 like, uh, ideally you have to look at, look at all possible futures and then come up with the policy, but that results in a state explosion problem. So we kind of, uh, in, in this paper, we ended up uh, looking at certain myopic policies, and those tend to have uh, reasonable behavior, no theoretical proof of any uh, approximable guarantees or anything of that sort. But at that point, we realized that why not uh, start looking at uh, adversary, uh, strategic adversaries, where the adversary is not randomly whacking edges, but he's interested in hurting you where it hurts the most, essentially, rather than randomly deciding where to throw the, uh, throw the dart. So, uh, so he observes the network and attacks where it hurt the most, uh, but here the model is also that the action is simultaneous. You don't get to, he doesn't get to observe, uh, he gets to observe you, but you don't get to observe his move before you make the next move. It's kind of simultaneous move. So I, you have to say that I am, I am protecting this link and he also decides where, which link he wants to attack. So like in a cyber scenario, you don't know where the cyber criminal is going to attack, but you may want to shore up or, or pro, shore up the protection at certain parts in the network. And it's a simultaneous move uh, type of a situation. So the simple situation can, uh, and, uh, you, one could see here that you have this initial network scenario, the attacker attacks 
the attacker action is some at attack uh, A, and the defender action is either, uh, def designer action is either defend the link or grow the link, or grow the network. So the, in the simple model, essentially if the uh, attacker guesses, uh, the de if the defender guesses right on where the attacker is going to attack, then no harm is done. So the link is protected. But and similarly, if the attacker uh, anticipates that, oh, the designer is going to add a link here and I'm going to attack here, even then it's fine because the attacker already was prepared while he was trying to grow the network. The problem happens in these two other situations where, uh, where the attacker uh, uh, guesses that uh, uh, I want to attack this link where the designer guesses wrong. So essentially, the designer is left with the link which he was defending, and the other link is deleted because the attacker was, there was nobody to protect. And uh, in the final stage, where the uh, designer decides to grow the network and the attacker attacks an existing link, so there you get this case where, where uh, excuse me, so uh, there you get this case where uh, the resultant graph is not a subgraph or a super or a superset graph of uh, the original graph. You get a completely different graph. So, uh, so, th so this is the simple uh, model that we started with the rules of the game. Now, uh, before I go, yeah, go ahead. The defender always overrides the attacker in this model. Uh, now there's another uh, caveat which I will, uh, there's another probability parameter which I'll bring in later. So uh, before I study the, uh, the uh, topology uh, sequence game, uh, just to sort of look at what kind of uh, structures you can get out of these uh, uh, equilibrium distributions uh, in these in this two-party games, uh, I just wanted to motivate with this problem, which is a monitor, monitor placement toy problem, where uh, it's kind of like, let's say you have a, a uh, software-defined network, and you want to install a controller on one of the nodes. And you want to install a controller at a node which is kind of uh, has a low eccentricity, where it's kind of close to most people uh, in the network. And the adversary wants to attack the port of the particular node such that it prevents you from controlling the network. Um, he's not quite d destroying the topology in, because uh, uh, that hurts the analysis, so I kind of made that assumption, uh, this toy problem. He, he can just disable the monitor feature of, the, of, the, of what the designer wants to do. So here the rules of the game are, are that D could place a monitor at any node, and A can attack the monitor port on any node. So again, if D places the monitor on node V, let's say, and A guesses correctly and attacks V, then he's successful. So it's, it's the reverse of the previous problem. If they align together, then uh, the, the utility that the different designer gets is zero. But if D places monitor node V and A guesses wrongly and attacks the monitor port of some other node W, which is not V, then uh, the designer ends up getting a utility which is a reciprocal of the eccentricity of that node. And uh, here the utility is high, uh, high utility is good, low utility is bad. Uh, and then you can kind of uh, see that uh, there is a mixed strategy space. One could uh, so so in general, you won't get any pure strategy here. There's a mixed strategy space, uh, and p p1 through pn. This vector vector is the probability mass that the defender puts on each node in the network. With probability pi, it will defend node i, and uh, with probability qj, atta uh, attacker a will attack node j. And, and uh, this is the matrix you can form. Uh, and the row and the column uh, is uh, the designers are the row players and the attackers are the column players. So uh, notice that all entries in a certain row are equal except, uh, except the um, diagonal element because that's where both parties guess right uh, or the attacker guesses right. So the expected utility has this quadratic form. Uh, and uh, what, what happens is you could uh, sort of exactly compute the uh, equilibrium probabilities in this particular case. Because of that particular property that all the row entries are equal, uh, the thing, uh, you can use this principle of indifference. Uh, I will not uh, go into too much detail into, uh, into that, but it's uh, pretty common uh, to actually work backwards and solve that the placement probabilities are given by EI over sigma EI, and attack probability is slightly more different. Uh, 
Now, the interesting thing is that the placement probabilities uh, are proportional to EI, which means the uh, designer favors placement of the controller on nodes with high eccentricity, which is counterintuitive. Because normally, if you didn't have the strategic adversity, you would try to choose nodes with low eccentricity. But because the attacker also sees that, he wants to attack those nodes. The defender is kind of fudging that and evading the attacker and trying to skew his probability distribution in a different way. So this is the uh, uh, interesting uh, sort of dynamic that happens here. And the attack probabilities are, uh, you would expect, it tends to attack the low eccentricity nodes as expected. And the utility at Nash equilibrium is uh, also computable in this form. So this is the kind of analysis we uh, uh, would do for the topology compliance problem as well, although in that particular problem, the math is not so easy to work out because uh, the row, the bimatrix game formulation is not as easily amenable. But we, we'll, we still have some uh, nice analytical results uh, similar to the one that I just showed. So, so here you have, uh, again, that topology compliant sequence or policy compliant sequence. So we have marked certain edges, E sub i, E sub j, and E sub k plus one, and you, have, you are in current state G sub k, and there are k, uh, capital K number of topologies, and each is uh, denser than the previous one. So designer action, uh, as, I def as I defined it, it's, it's still the same. Now, the only twist is this, that there's a probability parameter now. So if uh, the attacker attacks link J, and the def designer defends link I, which appeared before link J, then, uh, and, the, and you are in state K, with probability P if the attack is successful, so P is the attack success probability, you would actually fall back, even though the designer is, even though the attacker is attacking link J, if you delete link J, it will become policy non-compliant. So, because uh, it's, it's not, uh, so you'll have to fall back all the way to the previous uh, topology, which is still uh, belongs to that chain uh, that's allowed. Otherwise, you would land up in some other part of the poset, which is not in that chain. And uh, with probability 1 minus p, you will actually stay at, uh, uh, at this current state. And similarly, in the growth phase, uh, mm -hmm. uh, with probability 1 minus p, actually, you will grow to this network, uh, to this particular topology. And with probability 1, if, if the attacker decides to attack link j, and you also decide to defend link j, then with probability 1, you'll stay back in the, in the same topology. So I wouldn't, I mean, this just uh, codifies this. And with uh, what happens then is that uh, you can uh, now define the payoffs and costs, where uh, there's a cost, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, of the, how much does it cost to defend a link or attack a link, attack an anticipated link, defend an anticipated link. And in general, one could assume beta less than a alpha, but it's not necessarily the case, because uh, uh, I mean, we thought that existing edges are already more established. Hence, cost of attacking existing edges uh, uh, should be lower than the cost of anticipated edges. But, so um, that that uh, may or may not hold. Uh, but but again, it's it's a non-zero sum game if these costs are non-zero. But uh, for uh, and we have generally studied the non-zero case. But for this talk, I'll keep it uh, to be the zero-sum uh, game situation. And so now, uh, so you, you get a similar matrix structure for the, for the game, where the defender is on the rows and the attacker is on the columns. And you are at matrix, uh, you're, you're at state k. And essentially, both of them get these uh, types, certain uh, values of payoffs as a function of this g sub k, which is network property cost of that particular topology k. So imagine that to be the eccentricity or the shortest plan or whatever. So here, because of this introduction of parameter p, there ex do exist some pure strategies depending on the value of p. So for, in particular, uh, if p is actually less than 1 over k plus 1, which means the attack success probability is low, is, uh, one, and k is the number of st states, then uh, and this GK is concave decreasing, the, the graph property that you're looking at is, uh, uh, is concave decreasing, so this way, uh, then uh, the growth strategy is the optimal strategy. So you should put all your, the probability vector becomes 0, 0, 0, 1, that is, you have to try to grow the network if you're a network designer. Don't bother protecting anything. 
uh, because the, even if the attacker is, uh, guesses right, uh, he would still be unsuccessful with a high probability. So in the expected utility sense, it is a, it's a dominating strategy. And, uh, but if it's not, if that's not true, then very little can be, I mean, then you have to fall back to make strategies. So uh, pure strategies just don't exist in this particular type of formulation. So I have five minutes, so let me, uh, so, so that's kind of the basic uh, the formulation. And uh, this can be, uh, because of the introduction of this pro pro parameter P, what happens is that uh, this results in, uh, in a Markov chain uh, on that, on that uh, topology sequence space. Because you, you kind of, some topologies become more popular than the others based on that value P and based on the game that the two uh, parties play on that topology sequence. And so then your natural question is, are there any structural properties of these mixed strategies which are interesting? Uh, what are the state transition probabilities uh, going from one state to another? And I have a slide on uh, which will make all this clear. Uh, and what is the steady state probability of being in each particular topology, G sub i? Uh, once you play this game. Now, this is still a one-shot game. So you are, uh, at every time step, you are solving the game, figuring out the probabilities, and leaving it there. And then again, is the second, is in the second uh, stage, another uh, instance of that game is getting played. So we relax those assumptions, but as I said, the analytical tractability of uh, those uh, hasn't been uh, um, very favorable. So, so as, as always, uh, as before, the initial intuition is that the adversary targets important edges uh, to inflict maximum damage, and the, desired pri uh, the designer prioritizes the defense of important edges. Uh, but that's not true, because they might defend the most crucial edges, and uh, any attack on those edges may be neutralized, right? So therefore, a shifts the focus. A, A knows that that you 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 are you have a fortress around those important edges, which will really uh, which are critical for your centrality value. Like if this edge, like in a dumbbell topology, is the middle edge, so the defender will put a lot of probability on that edge. So the attacker would say, okay, since I, my attack will be neutralized, I might as well get some gain by attacking something else. So so because of that. Uh, the attacker takes some chances and attacks different edges than the ones which are most important in the network. So we were able to show certain um, nice distributional uh, monotonicity properties uh, for these uh, uh, mixed strategies. So essentially, uh, the uh, adversary PMF, it grows, so the x-axis is the uh, link, the order of links, uh, order of importance of links. So one being most important and k being the least important. Uh, and this is in this particular case is the difference between G sub i and G sub i minus one is only one link. So this is a, a it's monotonically inc increasing and uh, up to a support set of the designer PMF, which means that uh, the support set meaning where the designer decides to put some defensive resources. That's the support set. So over that support set, the designer PMF is monoton has to be monotonically decreasing. That is, he defends more important links with higher probability, and the attacker actually uh, attacks those links with lower probability than, uh, than expected. So this, this one could prove for any uh, uh, monotonic graph function. It need not be convex or concave or anything of that sort. Uh, but it's a two-party two uh, game scenario in this case. Now, once you have those probabilities, the R stars and the Q stars, you could uh, compute these transition probabilities of going from state K to state zero, state K to state J, state K to state K plus one, which is the growth probability, and staying at the same topology, essentially. So essentially, these classes of transition probabilities, you can create this matrix, you can solve the basic uh, Chapman equation, and uh, essentially you end up with uh, these types of uh, plots where uh, a good way of reading this is the topology index uh, is uh, how far could the network grow. So this is like a four node graph. So you're growing from some G0, which is a rich topology uh, potentially, but then you add one more link, you add one more link, you add one more link. So if you start with attack success probability zero, then the, in steady state, uh, the network will always grow and grow all the way there, but then as the attack success probability uh, increases, you kind of walk down this and the mass shifts, but then it suddenly shifts, uh, uh, like at some point, point two one, it suddenly shifts 
to here. That is, there's no zero probability of actually getting uh, uh, to, node, to state three. And then again, it walks downwards at 0.495, and that once you go to 0.5, it suddenly shifts all the way to topology one. So after probability half of attack success, basically there's no chance that the attacker, uh, or at least in the expected sense, and the attacker can, uh, or the defender can grow the network below beyond G1. G sub one. So essentially you can kind of look at that, uh, even for large graphs, uh, in this, this kind of phased step function behavior in uh, the maximum state which you can reach, that's, uh, that can be observed. I'll skip this. Uh, now real quickly, uh, I'll uh, go to the two extensions. I'll uh, just run out of time. But the two extensions are where instead of uh, imagining a nice uh, function like this, maybe there are m other monotonic functions which are more complicated, like some sort of a balanced decay or a double decay or a sigmoid, et cetera, where it does decay with, uh, as the graph gets denser, but then what happens is if you play the one-shot game, you are likely to get stuck here uh, because you are always just uh, wanting to, you, you, don't see, you don't see past the cliff, essentially, that uh, you would see if the graph, uh, if the graph function was this. So in that case, uh, you have to play a multi-stage game. That is, what happens, you'll have to play out all those scenarios that what happens if the adversary did this in the next round, and I did this in the next round, and uh, in the third round, the adversary did X. Uh, and it's kind of like playing chess and taking uh, uh, the next uh, few moves into account. And then it becomes like a multi-stage Markov game and uh, one could, what we have, uh, we have seen is at least from a simulation point of view, uh, techniques such as true learning actually end up doing much better than one-shot type processes. Like just to show this example, uh, the green, uh, so this is a high attack success probability, P0.5. The green is uh, Q learning, and uh, blue is myopic, which is what I described in the one-shot case. And uh, triangle is uh, the rollout policy, which is somewhere in, in between in complexity. So the higher, the more the mass towards the left, towards the right, the better it is, because then you have more chance of operating in a denser, richer topology. So Q learning is able to kind of uh, uh, learn those adversary strategies, and the adversary also is also doing a Markov game setting, so he's, he also is not handicapped in any way. So then one could show that this, uh, this would yield uh, uh, these types of uh, performance, but we haven't been able to show any theoretical proof that Q-learning necessarily beats uh, playing multiple stages of one-shot game in this particular scenario. Uh, I'll skip this. Okay, so uh, this is the last slide. Uh, so what, what, do we, what would we, where, would, where do we want to go from here? So, so far we have assumed complete knowledge of network state. So it's just two parties, both parties know what the network state is. And they can exactly observe where, who is adding what, et cetera. And they also have knowledge of the payoff structures. They also have knowledge of others, others actions and resources. So well, we would like to relax these. Uh, the other uh, more interesting problem is where instead of an adversary, uh, one single adversary, it's more like a game of soccer where you have two networks kind of mingling with each other. So imagine that uh, the soccer players form a dynamic graph of like who's close to whom and who's, who could pass the ball to whom or passing range, et cetera. And similarly, the defenders have a similar network. Uh, the other team has a similar network. And there's the sphere of influence between these two. Who, uh, so I can intercept a pass. So one could imagine that we have done some thought exercises that it's possible to uh, sort of model these networks as adversarial networks and decide what are the optimal strategies or are there any equilibrium strategies of such networks. Turns out there's a lot of data available for those types of uh, sort of proximity networks, et cetera. I mean, from Euro 2008 and people have studied passing lane network, passing between soccer players and so on. So that's one of the uh, pet projects I want to uh, take up after with this. And finally, there's the decentralized behavior where you don't uh, have two parties, but everyone is kind of on their own and they want to decide, uh, like they're not, they are either cooperating or competing with others in order to do a network formation. So it's a more classic network formation, but with an adversary uh, in, the, in the mix. So, um, any questions?